Man, it's so good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we start the new year off with a Seahawks win today, if anybody cares. All right. Awesome. Man, I'm glad you're here. I want to welcome you. I want to welcome our online campus and also our south campus in Centralia. We're streaming there live today. So uh, welcome to all of you. I want you to take a Bible, if you don't mind, and turn to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus 16. That's going to be page 62 if you're using an evergreen Bible. And uh, we're going to get to that in just a moment. I've got a few things I want to talk to you about. And then I want you to keep that Bible open. We're going to look at several passages near each other. Uh, in that zone. <clears throat> First, I got to tell you, um, I don't know if it's nine years ago today or nine years ago next Sunday that Sue and I began serving as your pastors here, but it has been an incredible honor to do that, and it has flown by. It feels like yesterday. And we had, I don't know if you know this, but we had a relationship with Evergreen for years. Uh, I actually asked Sue's parents if I could marry their daughter in the parking lot here in 1982. Uh, so we've had a long relationship with Evergreen, been big fans of this church, and continue to be just blown away at the caliber of a church that you are. So let me just give you one sample of your awesomeness. Last weekend, we did a celebration Sunday on the Adventure Fund. Uh, that's how we add venture capital to strategic partners locally and globally who are doing great things in the world. And uh, we shared some incredible stats of your giving, and then we mentioned that we were a little bit short, and so last Sunday, you guys contributed $59,000 more to the Adventure Fund last weekend. But wait, there's more. Uh, all year, you know, every year our, our elder team sets a projected budget. And that's projected income, and we kind of make our planning off of that like you do at your home. And we had projected a 10% increase in giving this in 2019, which had been the uh, previous three years had all achieved 10% giving increases. So it uh, turned out it wasn't going that well. And so um, we, had, we were carrying about 100 and sometimes as high as $130,000 deficit at some points in the year. And in December, uh, December right at Christmas, it was at 85000 And last weekend, we didn't even talk about that. Last weekend before the end of the year, you guys gave $169,000 in giving and worship. You just got to gotta do that. And here's what's so cool about that. We thought we were going to finish the year about 85000 in the red. We finished $9,800 in the black uh, because of that. We were in the black, but I, I mean budget-wise. Anyway, you continue to blow me away at your generosity toward God and toward uh, human need and suffering and the mission of Jesus around the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I, this is the first time I've actually been able to talk about it without having a tear come to my eye because I'm so blown away at your faithfulness and your generosity. So thank you for doing that. All right, so uh, next Sunday we kick off a new series called Made for More. And I wrote a booklet for you to go along with that series. And this booklet will give, be given to you next Sunday as we kick off the series. You'll take your uh, weekend notes in here. There's also daily scripture readings and uh, reflection questions each day. There's also uh, memory verse for each week. And then there's discussion group questions for you and some friends to talk about what you're learning. And we want you to make a, an extraordinary six-week commitment to this process. These booklets will be given to you next Sunday. And then we will start that day, and we're going to go through the book of Ephesians, and we're going to learn how God can move us from discontentment to significance. And I believe that the book of Ephesians is, I mean, the, how can you pick out one book of the Bible? But it is amazing. I believe this is going to be a significant season in your life, so uh, please make a commitment to that. Also, um, make a commitment that for those six weeks, you'll get with some friends, or if you're married with a couple of couples, and, and do the discussion questions. I think it will really help you. Um, we have small groups here at the church that you can jump into. However, most of them are full. And so we need at this last hour, we need a few more people to step up and say, hey, I'm willing to facilitate a group. All that means is you'll meet people at Starbucks or at Panera Bread or at your home. And you, won't, you don't have to teach anything. You just facilitate the questions that are in the booklet, help each other, have a good time. 
Um, if you're willing to consider that, there's some men in the lobby who are moderately good looking. They're standing at a table for Made for More. And they can answer your questions and get you signed up if you're interested in doing that. Okay, that would be, that would be pretty awesome. All right, so uh, it is time, this time of year, where everybody's making decisions about how to improve our bodies, uh, how to maybe make some financial changes, uh, maybe some goals for the year. I went and worked out yesterday, uh, I think about 11. I was thinking I would give it a little delay because, you know, for the first three weeks of January, uh, fitness clubs are more crowded than ever. By the way, churches are a little more crowded than ever. And then in the, and after about three weeks, that kind of sizzles down. And so I thought I'd go late to work out so that it would be less crowded and I couldn't find a parking space. It was crazy. All the machines are being used. It was just, so this is that time of year. And we've kicked off the year with the 21 days of prayer and fasting. If you're in the middle of that with us, I pray that God is moving in your life. I continue to hear stories of what God is doing. And I hope that's a positive experience for you. Um, and if you need any resources for that, you can find them on our website. But I want to talk to you about a, a New Year's commitment that I have made that I want to ask you as your pastor. I want you to make it as well. And it is a commitment to become, um, to rest. It's a commitment to rest. Many years ago, there was a document turned into the Japanese government talking about uh, work issues. And it described a man they called Mr. A for his, to protect his identity. He worked at a company and he worked typically 110 hour weeks. He was working seven days a week. He was working about just under 16 hours a day. 110 hours was his busiest weeks, but he was working in that 90 to 110 a week, week after week after week, year after year. And they found him dead at his desk from a heart attack at the age of 34. What we have is an epidemic of our inability to rest. Uh, I believe it's at epidemic proportions. We see it in higher anxiety rates. You see it in higher depression rates. You see it in higher suicide rates. Uh, we do not know how to rest in God. And I want to share with you God's answer to this problem, which is something called the Sabbath. Now, I'm going to confess to you right here that, uh, that I have had a change in my heart on the subject of the Sabbath in the last quarter of 2019. And I want to share with you my, uh, I believe the Sabbath uh, serves us in two ways. And I'm going to describe the first way to you first. And that's the way I've been enjoying Sabbath my whole Christian life. And then we're going to talk about the second way of Sabbath blessing that I have been ignoring my whole Christian life. And uh, it's cool how God brings resources to you at the time that you need them. So uh, back a while back, I began to have some conversations with a new friend of mine, Marlon. I saw you here this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, my new friend, he, he's uh, Seventh-day Adventist and has... So we just became friends. He's a dentist. He's been a missionary dentist in Africa. And we just began to share our, our faith with each other. We just became friends. Uh, every handful of weeks, we would get together again. And uh, we talked about the Sabbath a lot at first. But then we talked about all kinds of things. And it became just a real rich friendship of uh, enjoying how God meets us and how God is at work in our lives. Just a very encouraging Friendship. At the same time, there's a podcaster I listened to named Michael Hyatt. Michael Hyatt had three times gone into the emergency room believing he was having a heart attack uh, when, in fact, he was having anxiety attacks. And so uh, he began to wrestle with the concept of rest. And then um, in October, late October, I thought I was having uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, I had that in the past. I had AFib. Did medicine for a while, it didn't work. I had a heart procedure done back in, uh, I think, March or April of 18. I think that was right, somewhere in there. And, uh, and it cured it. But it felt exactly like that. And so I was persuaded that it had come back uh, after about a 26-hour nonstop of AFib. I went to the urgent care of our insurance. And, and uh, you know how this, I don't know if this happens to you, when I go see the doctor, 
uh, inevitably the symptoms I'm complaining about do not happen while I'm there. That happens when I get my car looked at. That happens when I go to the doctor. And so I was just like, don't you stop doing this while I'm there. And they hooked me up to all the stuff, and sure enough, it's happening. And I'm like, good, he's going to see. This is AFib. And he says, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Your heart's great. And so I began to just process that, and I believe that it was uh, an increase of anxiety and exhaustion. And so all of these kind of converged together. Then uh, my uh, assistant, Christine, get, is, she gets an email from her family uh, talking about a, uh, a message that they had watched on the Sabbath. And she sent that to us and said, everybody should watch this. And so I watched that, and that was like the clicker. Okay, that was by a guy named Robert Morris in Dallas, Texas, guy at Gateway Church, one of the heroes of mine. And uh, he's got a book out called Take the Day Off. It's a new book, and he was doing part of the book in that message. And I've already devoured part of the book, and uh, rec it's, I recommend you read it. So all of this to say that God has graciously brought me to the place of recognizing my need to practice the Sabbath. So I want to talk to you about the two ways that the Sabbath is a gift from God for us and how to participate in it. So we're going to start in Exodus chapter 16. Now, uh, the Sabbath is a law in the Ten Commandments. It is commandment number four. <laughs> I didn't expect an answer, but I got a couple. So that was a couple more than I expected. So uh, commandment number four. And, uh, but Exodus 16 occurs before the commandment is given. The commandments are given in Exodus chapter 20. In chapter 16, we, we're going to see an episode where God is calling them to practice the Sabbath before he made it a command. And so we're going to start there. That's Exodus 16. I think we're going to start at verse 23 and read through verse 30. Now, in this scenario, uh, the children of Israel are, are escaping slavery in Egypt, and they are wandering through the wilderness. God is providing for them bread every single morning on the earth. It shows up. It's called manna. In fact, manna just means what is it. When they saw it the first day, they said, what is it? Manna. So that's what they called it, sweet little thin honey bread. And uh, it was the way God provided for them. Now what God told them is, I'm going to provide that bread six days a week, but on the seventh day, uh, you don't need to go out there because there won't be any. And on the sixth day, you need to take two days' worth home with you. But on the other five days, only take one day's worth. If you take more than that, it's going to get maggots and spoiled. In fact, people tried it, and it got maggots and spoiled. I've got this whole thought I've had in my heart for years, how to keep the maggots out of your manna. Because God wants to bless you, but if you don't manage his blessings appropriately, it gets maggots in it. And so uh, this is what's going on. So that's where we find ourselves right here in Exodus 16. And so we're going to start at verse 23. And uh, if you're willing and able to stand for the reading of God's word, we would appreciate it. And here we go. Moses said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will, find, you will not find any of it on the ground tomorrow or today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That, it, that is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. That is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. Now, God gave us this uh, idea of Sabbath. It's not an idea. It's a gift, and it's not just a gift. It is a commandment. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But this idea of Sabbath, it means rest. The word Sabbath means rest. And it comes from creation. When God created, he created for six days. And after six days of creation, it says that God rested from his work. The word rest means to inhale. It literally means to take a breath. You ever, you ever been so overwhelmed and so running so fast that you say, man, if I could just catch my breath. And this is what God did on day seven. When you think about God's creation method, he spoke creation into existence. And then on the sixth day, he created man and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. He'd been, he'd been exhaling. 
And on the seventh day, he breathed in, he took a breath, and he rested, and he made that day holy. Now, don't get tripped up on the word holy if you think that's too spiritual of a word for you and that you can't engage at holy. Holy means set apart. And so uh, he made that seventh day holy, set apart for rest, for you to take a breath. This was a gift from God. And he gave us this gift because he knew that our propensity is to be afraid, to, be, to be, uh, take matters into our own hands, not to, be trust, uh, not to trust God, uh, but to try to compile and build and, and more. And so he gave us this, this command. And it was not only that, it was a way for the people of God to distinguish themselves among other people on the earth. Uh, but God gives us this, this gift. Okay, here's way number one that we enjoy the Sabbath. Our Sabbath is Christ. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. When you go, to the, uh, when you go past the cross and you go into the New Testament, particularly in Hebrews chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 5, there's a lengthy discussion about the rest that God wanted for his people in the Old Testament, and they did not rest because they were disobedient. And then it leads us to this reality that that rest is found in Christ. And here's what it says in Hebrews 4, verse 9. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to have you turn to others in a second. It says, There remains then a rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters into God's rest also rests from their works, just as God rested from his. Listen to this. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. The passage goes on to talk about the word of God and the, and the grace of God. And so here's the concept of Hebrews 4 and 5, that Jesus accomplished for you an incredible gift. That is that you no longer have to worry about your sin separating you from God. Christ has satisfied the, the guilty verdict of your sin. As you confess and repent and trust Jesus, your sin is dealt with. And this rest comes. You get to enter into the rest of God. No more striving, no more chasing, no more... Uh, pressure. I've said, uh, you'll, you'll recognize this if you hang around here very long, that every Christian should be uh, absurdly happy, completely fearless, and constantly in trouble. And I kind of gauge how my life is going on those three factors. When I find times that I'm not absurdly happy, I go back to my faith and go, what's wrong here? Because I'm not seeing something correctly, I'm not trusting, I'm not operating in faith, because we should be absurdly happy. If we knew what God knows, we would never worry. And so it's about trust. And then so we enter into God's rest. And here's what Hebrews says. Make every effort to enter into God's rest. Not one day a week, every day. Here's the beauty of what Christ has done for us is you can experience no burden. You can experience peace, joy, provision from God 24 hours a day. Seven days a week, 365 days a year. And I've been doing that my whole adult Christian life. So when this thing started to happen to me, now here's my confession. The second part of the commandment, and here's, here's, here's the key. I had thought that Hebrews 4 is the New Testament fulfillment of commandment number 4. And that Christ then is my Sabbath. That I would say that I'm a Sabbath participant because I'm resting in Christ, I believe this with all my heart, it's easier to do this when you're not the one who's having a trouble or a crisis. But when you have a burden to bear, you should bear that burden only to the cross, lay it at the feet of Jesus and leave it there. And then enter into the peace of God and the trust of God and the sovereignty of God and enter into God's rest. Right? And so I've been doing that. But here's what I failed. This was my failure. The realization, the key is that it's, that it's both and, not either or. And I have failed to understand that the commandment in the Ten Commandments, number four, um, is still a command. And I had replaced that command with the reality in Christ of Sabbath rest. So what I've been is a commandment breaker. So here's the two ways that, the, that, the, that Sabbath serves us as we connect in faith to God. First, we have a 24-hour, 365, seven-day-a-week Sabbath in Christ. Man, he bears our burdens. From the time of the book of Jeremiah on, Sabbath keeping was almost entirely related to how much weight you carried. 
And so the idea is that you don't bear burdens anymore. Christ bears them for you and you have this rest all the time. And I was doing but, and we have a commandment from God to take a day, a week, and rest. So let me walk through four quick points with you on Sabbath as uh, described for us in the commandments, okay? And the first point is that Sabbath keeping is a commandment. So now we're going to slide to the right, just a handful of pages, to Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to read commandment number four. It's interesting that this commandment has more words than any of the other nine. Um, I think God gave us some detail here because he knew that we would argue this and not want to do this. And so there's, uh, there's more words on this one, but let's read it together or you just follow along. Exodus 20, we're going to start in verse uh, 8. This is where the commandment begins. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Again, holy means set apart. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For, six, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now the word Sabbath means rest. In Latin, sabado is Saturday. And so you can attach Sabbath to Saturday, but I'm going to, for the sake of this discussion, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to attach it to rest. We'll talk about days of the week in just a minute. The commandment from God is that you take one day a week, that you work six days and you don't work seven. And that you cease from your labor as God ceased from his. I love this, by the way. One of the reasons I find my Sabbath rest in Jesus is that God no longer practices the Sabbath. There was a point when Jesus did a miracle of healing on the Sabbath and the Pharisees freaked out about it. And they said, what are you doing? And he said, my father is at work every day till now and I'm at work with him. So I'm grateful that God doesn't take a Sabbath. I'm grateful that if I pray on whatever day of the week, he's responsive, he's on the job, he is, he is moving in our lives. But he wants us to take a Sabbath. And the reason is because he wants us to rest. He wants us to take a breath. Now, if you go back to Exodus 16 and you see that passage I read to you, hey, he says on the sixth day, grab two days worth of bread. If you grab two days of bread on days one through five, it's going to stink and get maggots in it. But on the sixth day, take two days because if you go out on the seventh day, there isn't going to be any bread there. I believe with all my heart what God is saying to you is, you can work that seventh day if you want to, but I'm not going to work with you. I'm not going to multiply your work. I'm not going to resource that. I'm not going to, I'm not, listen, you're doing that day on your own because I'm asking you to rest. So first of all, it's a commandment. The second thing, and I want you to slide a little bit to the right. And by the way, uh, this commandment is a uh, is commandment. If somebody, you know, when you ask Christians, why, why don't we practice the Sabbath anymore? And some of you do. Uh, but I get the sense by how quiet it got in here that I'm in a room full of sinners. And I, and I prefer that. I, I like that. Um, so when people would ask me, why don't you practice the Sabbath? I say, well, I practice the Sabbath every day in Christ. So then, uh, if, if, if you think about the other nine, would you, would you do something different with the other nine? Would you, would you break one of the other nine? Would you take God's name in vain? Would you build an idol and worship it? Would you steal? Would you lie? Would you murder? Would you commit adultery? When you think about this commandment in, in the list of God's ten, and man, the ten commandments are an amazing, miraculous thing. If, you, if all you had was the Ten Commandments, if that's all you had, and you lived your life by the Ten Commandments, you would be prosperous and fulfilled and connected to God. They are amazing. And if a group of people called a community or a city or a state or a nation would operate by the Ten Commandments, it would be an unbelievable community. 
They are stellar. They cover everything that needs to be covered in 10 simple rules. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't commit adultery and think that God was okay with that, and yet I was breaking this one. So I just want to first of all confess to you that I have been a Sabbath breaker for a long time. And I think that my life began to bear the, the impacts of that. And I want you to know that I've decided in the last bit of last year that I'm going to keep the Sabbath and that I want you to keep it too. And I believe that God would command us to do so. It's a commandment. The second thing is that it's a witness. Turn to the right and go to Exodus 31. Um, the, the Sabbath is a witness. Listen to verse 14. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Again, it's set apart to you. Anyone who desecrates it is to be put to death. By the way, there's only four laws that God gave the death penalty for. That would be murder. It would be uh, adultery. It would be rebellion against your parents. Not, not, um, not fighting your parents once, but continuous ongoing rebellion against your parents. Uh, and it was Sabbath breaking. It's pretty amazing that it makes that list. Um, for six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day should be put to death. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it. It is a celebration, not a punishment. It's not a prison. It is a gift. Uh, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. It is a sign. It's a, it's a witness. It is a lot like tithing. Many people believe, how could I give 10% of my income, the first 10% to God, how can I make it on the other 90%? But what people of faith know and what God has demonstrated over and over and over and over again is that 90% with God is way more productive, fruitful, and beneficial than 100% without him. And what happens, God says, if you keep the 10%, if you don't practice the tithe, then you're gonna, your money, your wallet is going to grab wings and fly away. That your, your, your possessions will break. I mean, you're going to pay. And one of my favorite preacher jokes is, you know, two guys are in the lobby on Sunday morning and they say, hey, where's Bill today? And the other guy says, well, Bill's in the hospital having his tithe taken out. Uh, <laughs> You know, God doesn't punish you. He doesn't punish you for disobedience financially, but you don't, he doesn't prosper you in, in his favor when you disobey the tithe. And uh, if you ever get audited by the IRS, they're going to tell you if they see a tithe in your, in your bookkeeping, they're going to go, nobody in their right mind would do that. It, it's a witness. And it's a witness between you and God, just like the Sabbath is. Why would you not take a day off? If God said, take one day a week off and you won't do it, why would you not do it? You wouldn't do it because you don't trust God. You think, I have too much work to do, and if I don't work on this day, I'm going to fall behind. Something important is going to get not done. And let me just tell you, graveyards are full of indispensable people. And you will join them one day. And so uh, it's, a, it's a witness. Here's the witness. God was letting his people... Remember, this is all an agrarian culture when this is written. Everybody's got animals. Everybody's got uh, farms. Everybody's got stuff to do. And animals don't take a day off from eating. And farms need constant care. And so God is saying to these farmers, I want all the farmers around you to watch you take a Sabbath and your farm be more productive and your animals be more healthy and more productive than their animals so that they will say, what's the story? Okay, Chick-fil-A is a living example of this right now. They close on Sundays, and they, if you do, I did, this, I did this myself several months ago. If you study fast food restaurants, they are higher profitability and more profit on six days a week than their competitors are on seven days a week. They are open for business 52 days less a year and they make more money than everybody else. Okay, that might be because it's chicken and we all want to get fat, but I think it's the favor of God on Chick-fil-A. Now, <clears throat> so it's a witness. I started a new Bible reading plan on New Year's Day, and uh, as I'm listening to that and reading along, uh, part of that went into Genesis with the rainbow after Noah uh, and the flood. And God said, as a, as a covenant, as a, as a sign... 
that I will never again destroy the, the earth by water. I'm going to put a rainbow in the clouds. Now, here's what caught my attention. It's funny how you read stuff a hundred times, and all of a sudden something else jumps out at you. God said, when I, speaking of himself, when I see the rainbow, I will remember not to ever flood the earth again and destroy it with water. I always thought the rainbow was a reminder to us, but it's actually a reminder to God. I think tithe is the same way. I think Sabbath is the same way. When God looks at you setting aside the Sabbath as holy to him, it reminds him that he's going to bless you double portion on day six so you don't have to work day seven. I think this is, a, this is a witness between you and God and between us and each other. Okay, third thing is that it's a very serious issue. Now, I'm going to take you to a passage of Scripture. Go over to Numbers. It's to the right, a handful of pages. And go to the book of Numbers, chapter 15. And I wrestled with reading this to you because a lot of people right now are running from the faith who can't handle the Old Testament God. And they don't understand some complexities of the Old Testament. And this is the kind of passage that freaks them out. But I believe the whole book is the word of God. And I believe that the sovereignty and the authority of God should be uh, submitted to. And I don't have any problem with God deciding who he's going to be and us adjusting our course accordingly. Uh, but this may bother you. But here we go. This is Numbers 15 and verse 32. While the Israelites were in the wilderness, a man was found gathering wood on the Sabbath day. Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly, and they kept him in custody because it was not clear what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, the man must die. The whole assembly must stone him outside the camp. So the assembly took him outside the camp and stoned him to death as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, you go, what? He's gathering sticks. The guy's gathering wood on the Sabbath. Legalism destroys, please hear me, trust in God. The Pharisees took this kind of story and they turned it into all kinds of laws of legalism that sucked the joy right out of serving God. They would say that you could carry, they, they made rules. Well, you can carry, uh, I, think, I think maybe five pounds was the limit. If you carried anything more than five pounds, you were working. Here's my view on this passage. The dude was a wood gatherer by vocation, and he is working on the Sabbath, gathering wood. He is doing his job on the Sabbath. People ask me all the time, well, what do you, what do, you do on the Sabbath? What are you supposed to do? Well, it's not about what you do. It's about what you don't do. What you don't do is your job, right? So, man, the Jews got legalistic with this stuff like crazy. Here's the God's heart. I want you to stop working. And so, uh, you know, we get into the days of the week. Today's Sunday. Uh, Saturday had been the Sabbath all the way through until the, com the resurrection of Jesus. Then the New Testament church began to worship on Sunday, but they still observed the Sabbath. And um, I don't think God cares what day. I think he wants you to rest one out of seven. I work today. I work you know, I'll be seven hours today. I work on Saturdays a lot if I do a wedding, if I have to go to an event. Your job may make you work on a certain day. I, I have now blocked out my Sabbaths starting last week into uh, all of January, and I'll keep staying a month ahead. Uh, but they can't always be on Saturday. Many times they are. The Jews would practice the Sabbath from sunset to sunset which is what I did this weekend because of some things I had going. So my Sabbath this weekend began Friday at 5, and it ended Saturday at 5. The point is that you would not do any work. I believe that God also wants to bless you on that day, and we'll get into that with this last part. Uh, and that point, by the way, was that the, that the Sabbath is a very serious issue. Our last point is that the Sabbath is a blessing from God. For this, I want you to go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, this is a really important conversation with Jesus. And it says this in verse 23. One Sabbath day, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his, as his disciples walked along, they began to pluck some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? First of all, uh, Jesus is going to show us that's not what was unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, have you ever 
have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and he ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made, was, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm not hung up on what day it is. What I want you to do is I want you to, listen, the Sabbath is a gift from God. It is a command. Not a command to squash you, to, to reduce your world, but a command to bless you. And he wants you to observe a set apart the day, work six, make that seventh one a day of rest from God. What do you do there? Well, you don't work. If you go back to Exodus 16, he says he wanted them to all remain in their place. You could say that what God wants you to do on the Sabbath is connect to your family, to love one another. This, uh, over the Christmas holiday, uh, I started practicing not working. Prior to this new commitment, I honestly cannot remember the last day I didn't work. And that's my, that's my depravity, that is my uh, addiction, whatever, it is my problem. And so I began to practice this. And so I put my phone away uh, on several of those days, didn't look at it a single time. Well, one of those days my mom texted me asking a financial question then she texted again, and then she texted again, and then she texted again. So finally she calls Sue's phone and says, is Jim dead? <laughs> because if you text me, I usually respond pretty quick. And uh, so I got in my phone, and I called her, and she literally was panicking, thinking I had been hit by a bus or something because I was not responsive. And it was restful. Talking to my mom can be restful too, but sometimes. <laughs> it was restful. There's some great resources out there on how to practice the Sabbath in restful ways. Here's what you don't do. You don't do what you do for a living. On my Sabbath, I don't do anything that has to do with pastoring this church. On your Sabbath, you shouldn't do anything that has to do with your work. In fact, you should set that day apart and enjoy the blessing of rest. I have to tell you, I've never been able to rest, but when I realized that I could rest because God makes me rest, when I could say, I'm not lazy, it's a command from God, my rest became sweet. I believe married couples ought to make love that day. I think that you should look your family in the eye and have conversations. If it's relaxing to you, you know, the guy gathering sticks, if you need to mow your grass, I don't think God cares about you cutting your grass on the Sabbath if that's restful to you. He doesn't want you doing your job. Why? Because you trust God that six days with God is more fruitful and productive than seven days without him. All the research shows that when you overwork, when you have no margin, when you work too many hours with too much pressure and little or no rest, your productivity declines, sick leave goes up, you're actually costing your company money, and you're doing a poor job. God knows all this, and he wants his people, he wants you to enjoy the blessing of God and rest one day a week. And then he wants you to outperform all of your contemporaries who are not believers. And you're going to outperform them in six days while they're busting their butts on seven days. Why? Because God blesses you, and it's a witness of the goodness of our God. Meanwhile, you don't have to just rest in Jesus on the Sabbath. Rest in Jesus every day. Because uh, he's working for you. Jesus never stops working. Let me pray for you, and I just want you to do two things this morning. If you are a sinner like me and you are a Sabbath breaker, I want you, as we pray together, I want you to confess and repent before God. And then I want you to ask God that this would be the year that you became obedient to the Sabbath and you enjoyed by faith the favor of God on your six days and the favor of God on your rest, all for his glory and for his blessing in your life. Okay, does that make sense? If you're a Sabbath keeper, you can skip the repentance part and join us on the commitment part. Let's pray. 
God, I'm so grateful that you love us. And from the time you made us, we spun out of control. We took matters in our own hands. We have uh, not trusted you. We have not sought to glorify you or submit to you. And what was your response? You became one of us and you carried our sin to the cross. You bore our sin on the cross and satisfied the righteous requirements of the law on our behalf. And now we are free from burden and we obey the commands not to earn your forgiveness, but as a response to it. And so we say thank you, God, for your great love for us. Thank you for your forgiveness of our sin. And Lord, we do confess to you, I confess to you, my failure to honor you with the Sabbath. And I ask you to forgive me for that. And I ask you to restore the energy that I lost because of that. And I ask you to be gracious in my life in spite of that rebellion. And now I ask you to help me, Holy Spirit, to be a Sabbath keeper. And I pray for all of us in this church family that you would help us be Sabbath keepers. Not as legalistic uh, Nazis, but as lovers of God who seek to glorify God and live in the favor of God because of the grace of God. May you be glorified, King Jesus, as we honor our Father with the Sabbath. Would you help us? Lord, when emergencies come, help us to be gracious. You said if your ox falls in a ditch, go get it out. So help us to not be so legalistic that we we don't find your grace in a time of a crisis. But also help us to be life managers so that our oxes don't keep falling in ditches. And you help us lead our lives better. And may you be glorified, King Jesus, by our obedience and our trust. We ask it in the wonderful name of Christ. Amen.